Peace, peace, and welcome. We're glad you're here. This is the Cook on Monday Morning Podcast. I am here with the Vice President, the homie, <laughs> Gabriela Lopez. Good morning, Gabriela. Hi, good morning. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? I'm doing great. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, it's good to have you here. Thank you. Um, at Cook on Monday Morning, we believe that if you own Monday morning, you can own the week. If you own the week, you can own the year. And if you change your year, you can change your life. So I have the great distinction or the great honor to serve with Miss Lopez on the Board of Education. And uh, she is the youngest elected official in the great city of San Francisco. You still hold that title? Um, <laughs> I do, but hopefully not for long. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that was um, that was something that you came in and did, and I think it was really inspiring. But I know the work you want to do on the board um, is more about the people you serve, not about how old you are. So this is true. Yeah. Um, thank you again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, why did you run for school board? Um, I ran, I ran because I didn't really know what it meant. I didn't know what, it, what running a campaign looked like. Um, so I said yes, because otherwise if I, if I would have known, I think I, I would have definitely avoided it, mm -hmm. um, cause of the struggle. And we can talk about, we can talk more later about, um, what all of that means. But I ran because somebody asked me to. I had to sit and think about it for a long time. And I thought it was a little ridiculous to imagine myself in that space. But I'll say before that, um, when I was working my first year at Flynn as a teacher, uh, we were talking about the school board and like all of your faces came up, right? Cause we looked at the website and we were just kind of figuring out like what they do, just trying to share with teachers. Um, and in that meeting, I was sitting there like, Maybe in like 10 or 20 years, I can see myself in that space. Because again, um, despite the fact that I had like already a long history in this world, um, in various parts of it, I, I just couldn't imagine myself being ready for something like that. And that same year, maybe like eight months later, my friend asked me to run. I was like, no. Of course. And then I, I guess it's a thing, right? You ask people over and over again until they say yes, or women. Mm. Um, and then it kind of just happened where more people were excited. Like my teacher group was excited. And after that, it was like, okay, I, I, can't, I can't not engage in something that people are really supportive of. Uh, and, and it's a little bit about me in that sense that um, they feel we can make this happen if I'm a part of it. Um, so after that, that's the only thing that kept me from quitting during mm -hmm. the race is the support that I had. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm going to tell a story about when I first heard about you. Oh, I have a story after we met. Okay. You, okay. 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 You want to do yours first or mine first? <laughs> I've been holding it. How long have, how long have we been colleagues? I've been holding it for some time. Oh, so I'm, okay, cool, cool. All right. So. But I think this is a good time to share it. Okay, okay. So, um, you know, when, when you get elected, you often get asked to sit down to ask people's endorsements. Mm -hmm. And so meeting with school board members, obviously people want to run on the board. You want the endorsement of the, the people on the board is a part of the political process. And so from a lot of good people, I had heard about you. Mm -hmm. people that um, I respect. And when we met, um, I was like, oh, she's she's not a politician. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was kind of like a get to know. There, I had a certain expectation. I had a certain expectation of um, what the political process requires and how you have to show up to it. And one, one important thing for me is that you have to ask for what you want. Mm -hmm. and um, And so... When I heard that, you know, you're telling me about yourself, you came down to my office when I was at Mission Bit. You're telling me that you were in a, that you were a teacher. Um, we kind of kicked around stuff about you asked me about the experience being on the board. I remember that, and and I was kind of waiting for you to ask for my endorsement. I was like, 
Is she gonna tell me? Yeah, about we were. House? So I'll tell you. <laughs> okay. It was like it was like ten minutes total, uh-huh. and half of it was awkward silence. Uh-huh. So I'm proud of myself for asking you about being on the board. I think for for someone like me, like that's some pretty good. In, that's important insight. Like this is this could potentially be something I'm in. So I need to hear from someone who's on it. Um, but my thinking, and it, and this is what I mentioned earlier about the problems with this process is how we engage with it. Again, adding into um, this sort of idea of who politicians are, um, which takes out all of the people who we're trying to serve. That's why like what, what you said earlier, like I'm, a, I'm about who we're working with. Like mm-hmm. I see these people every day, I know their stories. So I bring that with me when we're um, deciding about, um, you know, the work that we're doing. But so I carried that during the race and everybody saw it as like a, a, almost like an immature way of approaching it. Like you really don't, like, I really don't know what I'm doing. Um, so why would, she really doesn't know what she's doing. So why would you support her? Um, but then you're not really opening up to people who are engaged with the community that you're trying to serve. So it's, it seems like opposite what we say we want to do. Um, so I go to, when we were in, uh, in our meeting together, Remember, this was after you canceled the first time. Okay, I don't remember that. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> I showed up. I showed up That's to good. Mission Bit, um, and then someone that works that that works with you shared with me through an email after I had arrived that you were out sick. Oh, okay. And I was like, oh man, like, you know, you're in North Beach. But anyway, no, it uh-huh. was it was it was funny. And then so we met again, and I I just got the sense like. He is not open to my stories. Like, this is not something um, that you're really about. So you had asked me, you said later, you said, um, you know, you didn't tell me how much money you raised. You didn't tell me who endorsed you. And then my, I think I, I remember responding something along the lines of, I wanted to share with you my work in, in this world. Mm-hmm. So I think it's really valuable. Mm-hmm. Um, and after that, I, I, I was really upset because, mm-hmm. cause it wasn't like, you know, like we, like there wasn't, um, an honest discussion about the work. Mm-hmm. It was about the race. And at that point I was already defeated cause I had encountered that a lot, mm-hmm. but it was the first time that somebody was like, you're not doing it the right way. Mm-hmm. Um, so then that's when I was like, I, I walked home from North Beach at the time I was living um, on Pine and Goff. And I was like, like, so almost like, what am I, what am I even doing? Mm-hmm. Um, and I, and I never forgot it. So part of me was like, God, I hope I win so that I can tell this story. <laughs> <laughs> and be like, look, you see, it doesn't uh, matter. Uh-huh. Um, uh, but, but that's when it was, that's when it really hit me. Like I'm going to have to work a hundred times harder then I'm already working so that I can share with people like having workers in this area mm-hmm. like really matters. Mm-hmm. Not, not like who we know or how much money we have um, and how connected we are with, with a very small population of San Francisco that's involved politically. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I like to think that that's part of the reason why my win was so big. Like we worked really hard and and people were were shocked mm-hmm. that it happened, mm-hmm. um, but it was very meaningful. So, yeah, yeah, uh, I was definitely shocked, and um, and I often admit that openly to whoever I meet because uh, what you did defied a lot of odds. Because um, and it's important, and it's important to tell that story. One of the one of the, as so. Um, when I started running for office, I knew one person in politics, right? And I often faced the same type of uh, feedback about not being, you know, not running a professional campaign. Mm-hmm. Um, and 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 I wanted to prove to people that I was serious. And so the process for me was like, oh, okay, like how do I show that I'm serious? Okay, I have to raise money. I have to ask for endorsements. And all of that was really uncomfortable for me. Mm-hmm. Like raising money was incredibly uncomfortable. 
And so the way that I justified it in my mind was that the people that I would get to help if I went through this discomfort was worth putting up with the discomfort. And so um, I'm, I'm at home by myself calling people, uh, asking for money, right? It's a lot of hours alone mm-hmm. here in rejection. Mm-hmm. And I put up with that because I thought like the end goal is necessary. And I think that the way that you did it, um, and hopefully we can get into it, like you did it a different way. And uh, and that way got you where you're at, right? <laughs> but they said, okay, you have to raise the money. You have to go ask the people. I'm talking to people and I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm from this city. Like right. I, gr- I grew up on welfare, you know, and I went to a good college and I did it coming from a high school in the city that um, didn't have a, a great area to see. They didn't have a, re- a great reputation. I, I came from Bayview, you know, going to high school in Bayview. I grew up in this neighborhood, but I went to high school in Bayview. Mm-hmm. And so I felt entitled to people's support. Like I'm from here. How are you not going to support me? You know? So I, I felt the same type of um, uh, animosity, but I felt like I put in the work and the work matters, the work of like the political work, you know, mm-hmm. the political work, the conventional political work matters. And I had to sacrifice a lot to do it. And so, and so after I met with you, you know, my feedback to everybody was like, damn, I love the idea of Gabriella, you know, like teacher, woman of color, running for school board. I don't know if she's going to put in the same type of sacrifice that I did, hmm. right, to be taken seriously as a candidate, because mm-hmm. the political work is a is a is a certain type of work. Now, now uh, you didn't do it that conventional way, and you so you won a citywide race, and I'm gonna say, you know, I talked about this in the past podcast, and I'm gonna let you talk about. I want you to kind of get into it, and I want you to talk about your upbringing and all of that, but <laughs> but I I I have to talk about a little bit from my perspective how astounding it was for you to win this race because um you weren't politically connected in the traditional way uh you didn't go out and raise all the money in a traditional way you didn't get the endorsement of the teachers union which is really important in this city you didn't get the endorsement of the democratic party and so i was sure you were going to lose (laughs) and you got you came in second place at the votes and everybody was like, who is Gabrielle? <laughs> I know. You know what though? I'll say, I'll say they still do that. Uh-huh. And that's why like, even, even after this year of work, like I'm vice president of the board now. Mm-hmm. And I feel like people are really just like, th- like it's like, it's a silent come up. Mm-hmm. Like no one is paying attention and it's almost to, to our benefit sometimes, but I definitely still deal with the, like, who who is she? Well, all of us that were watching the race, because your race was crowded. I mean, I, it was three, there were three seats. Yeah. Um, do you want to tell it? Because <laughs> I, I just wanted to lay the thing. I'm context, still healing. Like, I'm still healing. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Just um, the context was that it was, it was very, very, um, it was kind of, it was like an incredible, shocking outcome. <laughs> Just when you look at the common calculations. Yeah. And so. Well, so actually it's, you know, this was after the the 2016 election. Mm -hmm. So we have um, a rise in people who are dedicated and love their city um, and are didn't see themselves in these spaces before, including myself. So they're like, we're we're making these moves to be more involved. And that means running for office for some people. Um, so this three seat race was also three open seats. Mm -hmm. That was another thing. Once Emily Marase was, was no longer running, then we didn't have to compete with, the um, what's it called? Incumbents. It was an incumbent. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so it's three open seats. There are about 30 people who filed. Mm. And I think in the end who got on the ballot, there were 19 of us. Um, I was the only full-time teacher running for office. So I still had, you know, everything that we know about schools and, and teaching, I I was still living that. That alone is a lot. That Mm -hmm. alone, you know, it's often traumatic. Like it's, it's overwhelming. Everything that we know about schools is, is just, it was like my life. And then I had to deal with running a full-time campaign with people who quit their jobs to, to run full-time. So, so then 
You know, you're competing with people who have the time to make phone calls, who have the time to go to meetings. I couldn't go to, to certain endorsement meetings because it was during the day. Mm -hmm. So like even with the Chronicle, I had to take the day off. Mm -hmm. um, and, and with the sub shortage that year, my students had to be split up. So I remember making sure to say that in the interview, because I had emailed them before to share, to let them know, like, I can't, I can't take the time off because I'm teaching full time, but I really want to engage in this process. Um, and there was no, no other option. So it was just like, you're set up, um, to be involved in something that your job does not allow you. Like I, even as a teacher, we can't go to the doctor during the day. Like, unless we take a, a full day off, we can't do regular things because of the hours. Um, so I was working full time and, and trying to run this campaign with a team of people who are volunteers and who had also never done a campaign before. We're all teachers. So we had, we had no choice but to work in all of the hours that I wasn't in, in the classroom. And that literally meant like, and I didn't, like, I didn't see my family during this process. I'm from LA. I go, I go home like at least once a month. Um, but I had to give up all of my weekends from, you know, and I was campaigning from January to till November. Once September hit, we were, we were going door to door every single weekend. Um, after work, I would do a precinct, like every day I had, um, my flyers with me and if there was, and, and I had signs. So whenever I would walk down the street, if I was wherever I was going, if there was a shop that I could talk to the owner and, and let them know if I could put my sign up. Like I always had them. That was the one thing that aside from um, like the advice that I got aside from camp um, fundraising, getting endorsements, it was like always have your materials with you. Mm -hmm. um, so then it just be, it almost became an obsession. Like I had the maps, if, if the photo that you looked up, there's um, behind me, all of the districts and all the precincts within those districts. And um, one thing that I, I wanted to make sure my team um, valued was everybody counted. Everybody. We talked to everybody. And what I was noticing with other campaigns, which is also a funding issue, is you can get um, you can get like data around which precincts vote the most and, and like there are apps about it and all of that costs money. Right. But it's also like. To me, it's not valuing the people who were trying to help, mm -hmm. whether they vote or not. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we didn't do any of that. It was just like if someone said they wanted to help, mm -hmm. the bag was ready to go. Mm -hmm. That's an, another thing. Like with volunteers, there's no wiggle room. Like if there's an interest, you have to jump on it because it's easy for us to be engaged and be excited. But it like after time that goes away because life happens. Mm -hmm. um, so if in that moment, someone told me they wanted to, to volunteer, I'd say, what precinct are you in? I would give them a map and then, and then they would go. Um, and that just kind of like, it opened it up because people are more willing to walk around in their neighborhood. And it's not like one afternoon, it has to happen now. It's like on your time, you can engage with your neighbors, um, which I think people really liked. And that that got out to the point where like, on Twitter, people that I didn't know were wanting to help mm. and they would come out and like someone from Berkeley came out to the mission to pick up flyers and we're like, I'll, I'll help you pass them out. Mm -hmm. um, so it ended up being like over a hundred people that um, walked a precinct mm. or, or helped, bun it, you know, like getting all your flyers ready and bundling them up is also another thing. My hands were like, Mm. rubber bands on your hands like hour after hour does something to like I don't know like there was that I lost a lot of weight running mm. up and down those stairs mm -hmm. um but it was it was like it was the labor mm -hmm. and it's the same thing with with like working people like we're constantly physically exhausting ourselves trying to get by and I think that kind of that kind of thinking, that's just what I grew up on. That's what I saw my parents doing. That's what they said is valuable. Like when you're working hard, you're like succeeding. So that's all I knew. And that transferred into the campaign. So it wasn't like, like to me, it was the message that I want to show people is like, we're working really hard. Mm -hmm. um, and you could see it in how much we walked. Like that was an actual, out, like a tangible outcome. Mm -hmm. um, and in the end, there, we did about 400 precincts mm -hmm. in the entire city. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I can't say that any other campaign did that. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's, I think, I think the, I hope that at some point, um, there's a great 
documentation of what you did because I think it's important for anybody to consider if they're like disenfranchised from the political process, they they feel like they they're getting rejected by the establishment mm -hmm. and they they still want to push beyond that to participate. So not only that, because because winning is important, you know. Um, I think the work that you put in and the people that you make, because I've lost a race before. You don't mm. know what that's like to lose a race. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know why I'm laughing. I didn't mean to laugh like that. I know, well, no, well, we, were, we were talking about <laughs> the, the, before. I know, that's that, what yeah. came out. <laughs> um, but, but uh, yeah, so so doing that and winning is significant. And so, um, so you talked a little bit about, you know, working hard and and being a teacher I don't know what that's like either because you, <laughs> you, you did that. But I'm, I'm just wondering about that extra gear because what was your energy like before you started running? Like, were you teaching and then were you like yeah. laid out oh. all weekend? Like, what was it? Oh, God. Um, no. So it's, it's the same. And I actually paused that sort of... Um, I, I, I had to like balance it out once I got on the board and then I, en I ended up working, teaching in Hayward because um, that process was really, really hard. Um, so I actually had to like pause my regular lifestyle. But even before the race, like I'm constantly doing something. Hmm. So I remember I, I would always have this joke, like I love my calendar. It, it gets me by. It's like everything. And um, whenever I saw an empty square, that meant like there's something that I needed to do that day. Um, so before, you know, like after work on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I would volunteer at San Quentin. Mm -hmm. And then, um, I'm a core organizer of teachers for social justice. So we would meet, uh, at least once a month, but we had workshops, we had conferences, we had, um, different, different activities to engage with, with teachers. Um, in like in LA, I was always volunteering somewhere. I was, always going like at work I would just come in and do extra stuff or I was also going to school when I when I was going to school I had three jobs mm. I worked at a restaurant at night I was tutoring and then I worked at the nonprofit inner city arts that we are now collaborating with mm -hmm. and next week um <laughs> the district is gonna is gonna you know like we're trying to like meet and pitch ideas so they're gonna like pick my brain um but I was always doing something and so uh, when it when it came to this race, it was it was the same kind of like energy, but it meant pausing everything else. Right. And I think that was also hard because because um, I don't like not participate. I don't like like leaving things behind because it means like someone else has to pick up on that work or it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and even now, like I'm I'm kind of slowly getting back into that. But um I was, I was always just like running, mm -hmm. running mm -hmm. and either that, or I was like jetting off somewhere or like going on a two week road trip or, or doing something. Um, so the, so that was like, it was easy to do. It just meant giving up a lot, which was, which was hard. Yeah. 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 You, you definitely operate at a different frequency, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but I've never seen you, um, you know, you just kind of plug it in. I've never seen you really like, um, do a lot of like self promotion or talk about look at all the stuff, great stuff that I'm doing. It kind of comes out casually in conversations. I think well in the serving with you on the school board, I had no idea that you were going to San Quentin regularly mm -hmm. to to do that. And so, mm -hmm. what's that experience like? What does that look like right now? Um, so right now, I'm I'm in the process of re upping the the my clearance, which you have to do every year. And what I I began in 2016. Um, and what it is, it's a program, uh, that was started by the men inside who wanted additional support to pass their GED. So San Quentin has an entire, it's a prison university project. So they, they get, um, their bachelor's degree with, the, within, with the classes that they're taking inside. But in order to begin that process, you need a GED and so forth. Um, so they wanted to support each other. And then it built up to, to working with volunteers outside, um, who can help them with those skills. And th those, those come from teachers. So I was on, I, I love how this works because I, I knew about T4SJ when I was living in LA. And when I came out here, I was, you know, I wanted to build my group. I wanted to meet with, with folks who are like-minded. 
And um, I ended up getting really close with this group. I was on a panel at USF, which sort of introduced me to the to APEP, which is the work in San Quentin. And I've always, for a long time, I've, I've wanted to um, work in prison education. In fact, when I, I'm going to get my PhD and it's gonna be in that work mm. in the near future. Um, so I, I've always had an interest and I thought this is an opportunity because I'm talking to the people who created it mm-hmm. um, and who have, uh, who are proving that this, this process is successful and that like education is never ending. Like this is, this is just educate, this is education for education's sake, you know? Um, so they invited me over. I went through the, the whole process. In fact, I've had some people who were actually also working on my campaign also become volunteers. And when we go in, um, we do like some lessons, we do book clubs, it's, it's literacy and math. And I did all of my work around um, reading and writing. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and what I taught as an elementary school teacher transferred in, in that setting as well, as far as the, the engagement and the creativity that goes behind those kinds of lessons. And a lot of, of what we think around adult education is, is that we don't need that or we don't, um, connect with that. And that's absolutely false. I even see it in our, um, in our six hour long sit down meetings on the board, you know, there's, there's a lot of engagement that we're not connecting with because of how it's, it's, um, shared, how the information is shared. And, and that's just like what humans need in order to learn. Mm -hmm. Um, so I brought, like, I, I brought a lot of that. We applied it in the program and like, and they loved it. Like people love feeling excited to to learn something new um, without it being like, like learning is daunting. Um, and some, even, even my experience growing up, it was never like, like I never felt supported or accepted. I went to a very affluent white schools on the West side in LA and which is why I went into teaching, but that, but that sort of like that initial response and um, relationship with education is what I know and what I, I know the men are um, have experienced because they share that. Mm -hmm. Um, So, so to see like, to see education um, help light up someone's thinking and like open up their experience with this process. Every day I left, I felt like, I felt really enlightened and I felt like the journey was worth it to get there is really difficult. Right. And, and they talk about that a lot too. Like, how do we support people? Cause you're giving up like five hours of your day mm-hmm. after work. Um, but anyway, it, it's, it's always brought joy to my life. And when I had to pause because our meetings are on Tuesday nights and, um, and just like, you know, like trying to balance everything. Uh, it those, was really those are the hard. days when you went. You went on Tuesdays, Tuesdays and Thursdays. So you would teach a full day, then go to San Quentin and teach. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're kind of a superhero. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of corny, but like, but I mean, I, I think that uh, I mean you're, you're committed to to educating people, and you've done it in places where the disenfranchised are. Mm-hmm. So, so talk a little about like. The school community at Flint Elementary, all the beauty, promise, mm-hmm. struggle that that school had w- while you were there. When did you start at Flint? In 2016. Okay. And Flint is in like the Mission, Bernal mm-hmm. area. Right. It's actually like the cutoff. Yeah. Yeah. So you talk about it. What is the... Um. So Flint is, it really is like a home because you have... You have families who are dedicated uh, and generations of families who have gone to Flynn, who like remember Lacan, like they've they've participated and engaged and stayed um, loyal to this community for generations. And then you have teachers who have been there for decades. And then you have new teachers who are like embraced when the the moment they come in. Um, Actually, a colleague of mine who I'm really close friends with now, just because we've worked together, uh, called me over the phone when I was living in LA to, to get me to work there. And it was, it was, so during that time, SFUSD started that school year with 90 empty classrooms. Like we, we weren't where we are now. Mm-hmm. The moment I sent in my application, it was like offers after offers. Um, so for a moment I was like, wow, I'm like, I'm really, <laughs> I must be really, um, 
I must be really qualified mm-hmm. that people are like excited to have me work, but it's it's like, no, like you need people in these spaces. Um, so I had about four or five offers and then I landed on two ER Taylor and Flynn. Um, and I, I get a lot of vibes from people and I, I operate off of energy, just like my initial response to, to you, um, or, or like a space that I'm in is what I go with. And I didn't, I didn't sense that with, with the first school, but I did with Flynn plus my colleague, um, took the time to like share with me her experience working there and we would be partners. So that was another thing that like, this means this person is, is like fully committed to, to making Flynn the best place you can be. Um, to the point that she wants, she wants to be a part of that for anyone who comes in that space. And so, um, like when it, you know, you're new to a city and then you start, you spend every day with these people who are going through the same struggles as you, uh, you build something with them. And, and to this day, these people are in my life because we were more than colleagues. Um, but that's just what Flynn does. And, and there's such a beauty inside that, that doesn't transfer to the outside world. So anytime, like it, it got to the point where I got really frustrated with people who would say this. I think it's like, it just goes to show like how little you're paying attention. Um, but they, you know, people would react when they're like, oh, you, when I tell them I work at Flynn, like, oh, you were at Flynn. Um, Cause the other thing is we support all communities. So it, within one building, there's, um, there's really affluent families who live in Bernal. Mm-hmm. There, there are kids who don't even engage in the Spanish immersion. There's a store program. There's, there's a lot happening in one building because we're open to to everyone's uh, needs or wants or interests. Like the school has it, mm-hmm. um, but the outside community who doesn't like get to see the beauty of that only sees like what they see in front of Bernal dwellings. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. um, so that's also really special to me. I do I do home visits with every single one of my students, and um, that led me to see. Like, obviously, like you, you get to, you get a sense of how people are, are operating outside of, of a space that you see them in every day, which is really important. And I get, I get to see like very different sides of my students, but I also see how they are with their families and in the space, like this is where they go once they're not with me. Um, and I saw that in, in their homes, like I did have kids living in Bernal, like whole view of the city but mm-hmm. I also had kids living um like in Sunnydale and they had the same views mm-hmm. you know like like mm-hmm. it's still like a, a beautiful side of San Francisco that they have access to but just like very different worlds right all in one classroom mm-hmm. and that's what Flynn is mm-hmm. yeah and so what is the what is it what are some of like the top level demographic stuff that like number of students like ethnic breakdown you remember all of that stuff <laughs> no um I, I got a good story about flan i'm gonna tell you i'm gonna tell one real quick yeah yeah so so a good friend of mine was the assistant principal there for a while his name is sean messenger and he moved on to another site he moved on to be a principal at john muir and now he works in special ed at central office mm. but sean asked me to be the graduation speaker at flan <gasps> i think it was like the year before you got there i heard about that you heard about that yeah okay Did you go was it at a middle school? Was that um, what middle school was it? This is at Flint. No, this is at Flint Elementary. This was at the Brava Brava Theater. Oh, they did their graduation okay, yeah. at, yeah, yeah, yeah. at uh, Bravo on twenty fourth. Yeah, and so you know, occasionally, and this will happen to you more and more. Like we get asked to speak at graduations. I was asked to speak at Flint's last year, but okay. it was my group. Oh, okay. So, you know, okay, so I have that too. Yeah. Not just you. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, the Flynn graduation was unlike anything I'd ever experienced because it was like a um, raucous, <laughs> like stadium feel yeah. to the ceremony. <laughs> you know? It was like, like the parents were screaming at the top of their legs a fifth grade graduation yeah 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 <laughs> it was so much fun and so you know i had i did this thing where i was like if you if you love somebody on the stage make some noise mm. and then the whole crowd like it like hit my chest no. i was like i was afraid to talk it was crazy so the the love 
at Flynn is deep and they are vocal about it. Mm. Um, but yeah. That's nice. High level the demographic picture of Flynn. Um so it's it's mixed. Mm-hmm. And in my even in my classroom, like that's what you'll get. But it's majority majority Latino, African American, and white. Mm-hmm. Cool. And what grade did you teach? I taught fourth and I would loop with my students. Mm -hmm. So fourth and fifth. Got it. And so you were there for, well, I guess two years before you became. Yeah. Two and a half. Two and a half years. So you went from the classroom to the top level policymaking position. Yeah. So I I, I, I like to, I, I'm, um, I work with USF as a supervisor for their, um, their master program and um, teacher student student teachers who are aspiring to be um, classroom teachers. And I think back when I went through that process, it was 2014 through 2016. And I remember just like grad school in general, becoming a teacher, there's so many hoops that you have to jump through. Like not only is it financially difficult to to keep up with like the standardized testing you also have to deal with with like a full class load working in in a classroom for free Mm -hmm. you're not paid to do it and um and then you have to deal with these standardized tests which is you know how Mm -hmm. i feel about them (laughs) um but it's it's just another barrier like there are so many things that you have to go through in order to become a classroom teacher so that uh, that process alone um whenever I see anyone doing it like year one, you had already gone through all of that shit. So like, Mm -hmm. I, I, I just like, I admire the dedication so much. Cause, um, and, and I see that with the students that I'm working with now who, who often, you know, like they have to vent and they have to reflect and I have to remind them like, this is a process. That's not the reality unfortunately and i know the state is doing is like making moves to kind of change what that is california it's really hard to become a teacher mm-hmm. it's a lot harder um but but i have to i have to kind of tell my students my student teachers i have to remind them of that and then i think back of my own experience um and it's it's um so i i went through the years of becoming a teacher and within the first five years you still have to clear your credential And in order to do that, you have to engage in a two-year program. So this is after you've gone through the process, after Mm -hmm. you've gotten your credential, you've become a teacher. In five years, you have to go through a two-year program. SFUSD provides that in the process, which is really, we're really fortunate. But like in LA, it's it's another side, like weekend thing that you have to engage in that's like $3,000 when you're already teaching. My Mm. first year of teaching, I got paid Mm. $44,000. And I thought like, I made it. So, so that's just like, again, a barrier for people who are already working, like, like with their whole heart, you yeah. know? Mm-hmm. Um, so, so in my first, my first year, I completed my master's. My second year, I cleared my credentials. So the first two years I was going through this clearing of the credential process. My third year, um, I had a student teacher in my class. Like I was a master teacher. And this is another thing that I share with people, especially in education programs at universities. We as aspiring educators do not need to be in a classroom with someone who has done it for decades. Like you definitely can learn from, from people who have been in it. Of course, there's a lot of value in that, in their institutional knowledge. But I think there's also value in, in seeing what it's like for a new teacher because that's cl- that's more close to what you're going to experience. So I pushed for that at USF, and I had a full time teacher who was getting her master's, and and we re- we became co teachers. So now my my 22 students had two educators in the classroom, and those are the kinds of things that like I I was able to accomplish because of the relationships that I built in the city. Like the school didn't provide that, the district didn't provide that, but it it can happen um, when we talk about like co teaching. Like there there are ways. Um, and my fourth year, I won this race Mm -hmm. and then, and then that's it. Now I'm not teaching, (laughs) but, but I, I, I look back because I want, I want like future teachers to, to understand, like, those are the things they say are really hard. Like cleaning your credentials is really daunting. Um, we're getting your master's is really difficult. Like all like, it's almost like 
a pressure and a fear-based way of keeping people down that I don't agree with. And a lot of education programs um, operate in that way for whatever reason. They're not like, they're not really helping people, like they're not really empowering future teachers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, um, so I, I, the people that I work closely with, I try to share those stories to be like, it's, it's a process and it's a lot of work. But once it's out of the way, you can move on and like never think about it again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like. I mean, I think I think it's an amazing idea to have a process that people feel uplifted as they're participating and and trying to get through because, you know, the, the teaching profession is sort of a dying profession in the country, and it's it's one where um, people aren't. You know, there are people that are coming, growing up that want to be teachers mm -hmm. when they grow up, but. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like a, a stopover to something else. Yeah. Like it's been a lot of bad press about what it means to do it. Uh, it's been a lot of reform efforts around how to, you know, privatize education. It's like a lot of that happening, and um, right. and so we have to revamp how it's designed with the idea of that when people start, we want them to feel excited mm -hmm. and jump into something that is transformative. Right. Um, and you know your career has kind of been transformative, and so now you're trying to transform a school district. <laughs> What's that like? <laughs> um, like that transition? I tried to. It's, it's smooth. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I I realized this late in the campaign, but to me it feels really simple. What we're asking for, what we want, is mm -hmm. very simple. As a policymaker, yeah. you mean, as you were a candidate or now that you're governing? Um, I, I, the idea came as, a, as I was a candidate pushing for the policies because mm -hmm. you have to have an idea of like what you want people to support you mm -hmm. for. Um, and now that I'm in it, it's, it's kind of that same like it's really easy. Making it happen is, is where the politics get in it, not and where like the relationships are really important and like how um, engaged people are in, in your ideas and in your thinking, like all of that is why we've been stalled, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, but the work is definitely not simple. I don't, I don't think, I certainly don't take it for granted, but um, I, I think, you know, I really value being on the board mm -hmm. and we we come in with like knowing what we need and i guess our job is like so far has been trying to figure out how to get all the rest of the people to agree with you mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know yeah what what have been some things that you've been excited to work on since you've been on the board um the do you remember the arts resolution that we were passing mm -hmm. That has been exciting. That was really exciting because a lot of my teaching was centered around that. So, like I said, I worked at this nonprofit in LA. It's called Inner City Arts. And all of the work that we did was around um, helping teachers bring arts into their classroom with like little to no resources. Like, how do you make, um, how do you create magic with what's given to you? Because in, in our spaces, especially in L.A., like that, that's just what we know. There aren't a lot of resources. And um, I just saw like how we, we did a lot of professional development and we worked with with teachers, with principals. Then like more and more people got excited about these ideas, like whole schools would come to our site. Um, so all of that helped build my own practice. And I saw it within my students and I saw how then they would communicate with people and how they would take the ideas that we learned in one lesson and like apply it to their life when we were outside or when they were talking to their peers. Um, so to think that the resolution that we were pushing forward had those ideas set and to kind of make it happen for the district was really exciting um, and also interesting because we got a lot of pushback. Mm -hmm. So I think that part like to me was really fun because you had to start like convincing people. You had to start sharing with them why this is so valuable and why like for me, there's an understanding of the previous work that had has been put in to make it happen. Like, but then also like knowing we're all on the same page, we all want the same thing. Um, and we just kind of have to like figure out how to get there together 
Mm-hmm. Sometimes I'm not always like that, but but in this case, um, there's a group of there's a community of people who are really really um, passionate about arts education, and like we do need them to to work with us in order to make it happen. Um, so I kind of like saw it felt like months of of work and convincing, um, and then once I, I saw towards the end, like there was a little more engagement. And then it passed and, it, and you start to see it come come to fruition, which was really exciting. So so that kind of work is like I can I can see like I can share with you the success of it because I've lived it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why, like, we need people like like candidates like myself to be in these spaces to kind of share those narratives. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. And so talk a little bit about. Um, how what, like some changes that have happened in your life since you've come onto the school board. So like you, you know, like for, I'll, I'll do myself, for example. So um, I felt you, you're my first sitting elected official that I've had on the show. Hey. So um, I think that there was, there was this thing that I went, to, went through where you're sitting down and you're listening to public comment. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people are really angry about, you know, angry at you about whatever's happening and they want things to go a different way than that that they're going. And um, you get a lot of, you know, a lot of direct attacks, a lot of like animosity. And one thing that happened for me, like one thing was that I had to understand that this wasn't really like these people don't actually know me. This is not actually personal. But then when you hear it a lot, too, it's easy to be like, oh, okay, this is happening again. I have to kind of like, I have to detach mm. and understand this is what it is. Mm-hmm. But it also made me like a bit more guarded. Mm. And so, you know, my circle of people got smaller, um, you know, only, you know, I, I wasn't going out as much. Mm-hmm. Like I went out to something and the parent wanted to jam me up about the school assignment process. Or whatever. Oh, of course. <laughs> And so have you had any shifts like that? Have you like learned any lessons to say like, man, like, like, cause this, this work is, is beautiful and it comes at a personal cost. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, when I won everything in my life at that time, everything in my personal life had changed. Mm-hmm. Um, so there was, there was that just kind of like beginning, it was almost like beginning a new life, mm-hmm. you know? And I shared with you, like, I, ha- I was going through a divorce. Um, I had to switch my jobs. Mm-hmm. I, I stopped drinking. Like, um, you know, I wasn't going home as much. And that's, like, a big part of, of my happiness. So, so just that, that shift alone was, um, I was really lonely. It was uh, the first time in my life that I ever lived alone, which I, I remember um, resenting. Mm-hmm when I was in my last relationship, because I, I will never, I, I would always think I never, I'll never get to experience what that's like. Um, and, and then I did, and it was great. I was very happy, but I was also like going through all of these transitions. So, um, so beginning my work on the board and dealing with all of those shifts was like the hardest time Mm -hmm. of my life. Like getting up to work at 5 a.m. to drive to Hayward, Mm -hmm. then to come back to a meeting. Like I couldn't build out there. And I was like, I felt like I was like half um, invested in this work here. It was um, probably like the lowest point of of my life. So in that sense, I just kept having to tell myself like this was worth it. Like Mm -hmm. this going through this was worth it. But I also have to admit, I never thought I was going to win either. Mm. Mm. So, so there was a lot of, there's dealing with that. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's like this metamorphosis that happens with, um, when you transition into this other aspect of your life, like you, you ever see those, like those online, <laughs> um, surveys to find out what your spirit animal is. No, 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 no. <laughs> but I think I know what you're talking about. Um, so I took one. And my spirit animal was a butterfly. Oh. <laughs> and uh, at first I was like, I ain't no butterfly. 
<laughs> I'm a lion. You know, the, the game has a butterfly tattoo on his face. Oh, you know that? Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm like, you know, I'm too like strong right. to be. Right. But then transformation was essentially that's like the the process for a butterfly. There, there's yeah. something, and then they they float and fly. Right. Um, you know. I doubted your ability to win and getting to know you. I'm like, the city is so glad to, should be so glad to have you, mm. you know? And it's because it's, it's not only, um, I mean, I think the way that you want is important and significant, but the person that you are for the work that's, that this is, I think is, um, you, it's, it's like, it's also, it's even more important because uh, it is a rare combination when you can have someone that, is unyielding in their fight in pursuit of an outcome that is on behalf of the disenfranchised, but is also engaging and warm and mm -hmm. um, and likable, you know, because uh, the objective is important and bringing people along to that objective is equally as important. And I think you have to have a disposition like yours, at least from observing you, um, to achieve both things at once. So, So keep pushing. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, another thing that came to mind was uh, you talked you, a little bit before we started, you talked about missing the classroom. Yeah. And uh, my grandma has like this, she has this funny thing that she says about people. She was like, <laughs> you know, she, 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 this is, this is how she talks. <laughs> she's, she, she'll say something like, if you look like that, that's what you are. Yeah. And so, <laughs> She was like, he looked like a cop. That's a cop. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and you know, you're you're a teacher. Yay. I mean. I look like you, a teacher. Well, you you sound and feel like a teacher. Cool. Like in the morning at San Quentin, <laughs> yeah. in arts education, like you are, you're still, I, I want you to, I want you to say if you agree with this or not. Like, are you still a teacher? Yeah. And, and. It, it, it's actually, um, so I, I say this, like, you know, we're always asked to speak at things. Mm -hmm. And um, and in anything that, like, I'm sharing about myself, I usually always start with, I'm a teacher first. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm, and now I'm a commissioner, blah, blah, blah. Um, so it it is my identity. And that's another thing that I realized in this process that um, was hard because now that I'm at my current job, I'm not a classroom teacher. And that's, that's really hard for me because, um, because I, I, I want to be in that space and I want to be supportive and I want to help, but I'm not, I'm not the, the teacher that I'm helping. Um, so that comes like, we you know that comes with a lot of things, but it's also emphasizing the fact that I can't claim that anymore. Um, and people have told me, you know, like, clearly that's not, that's not true. That's not the case. And I have to remind myself, like, I went through that whole process, that whole daunting, like getting to be a teacher process that, that, um, will never go away. And I put in the years, even though they weren't many. Um, so like, like trying to hold on to that and like tell myself that that's still very valuable and it still adds it adds to the person that you are, which is a teacher. I've identified with, with education for a long time, like since, since I was a kid and I, I, um, I'm still very close with a friend of mine who I've known since we were eight. And like, she's like watched me grow in this process. Um, and is, and is just like a reminder of like what we went through as kids, um, that brought us to where we are today. And that like, reminds me why I am so invested in education. Mm -hmm. um, so I, people joke all the time about how like from here, you're going to, you know, like continue in politics. And I, I like, I, I don't want, I do not want to pursue that because I have like so many other plans in, in the education world. Like mm -hmm. I still want to transform um, the teaching programs that are prepping our future teachers mm -hmm. at various universities. I think that has a lot, like that needs a lot of support. Um, and I, and I want to work on my PhD and like do work research in prison education or, or like, you know, whatever that involves evolves into. Um, so definitely like, like even, even how I dress, cause you, you shared, you know, like you look like a, 
like a teacher, you're a teacher. Uh-huh. Uh, I, I definitely <laughs> still dress like a teacher. Like for me, uh-huh. it's like if I need to run, uh-huh. like I need to wear wear clothes that like allows me to do that. Because uh-huh. like when you're working with kids, you never know. Mm. <laughs> you might have to like jet out. Like you want to be wearing the right stuff, right? Mm-hmm. So that's mm-hmm. how I I navigate. I am absolutely still. Mm-hmm. I've earned my stripes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, and, I, and I think she was also talking about how you show up in the world, you know. And so, um, uh, I'm gonna wrap this up. I always talk about um, two things: leadership and legacy. <laughs> you, you've seen this. On I've that? seen. I've, <laughs> I've learned the pattern. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you for listening to the podcast. Podcasts yeah. are like my thing right now uh-huh. i'm really into it i i tweeted something uh-huh. you're only on twitter so this is the only thing you get to see <laughs> but um yesterday i i was like i ran out of podcasts like um i have like my go-to and then when you're you're not producing fast enough then mm-hmm. i have to then it's like oh what am i going to listen to now um and so i tweeted i needed recommendations and this is like the most love i've gotten on any tweet ever mm-hmm. um and then everybody's suggestions that I haven't gotten into, but it's like, it's a thing right now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Well, I listen, be like Gabrielle, listen to the <laughs> cook on Monday morning. <laughs> um, so I guess you've had some time to think about, or you, I mean, you obviously are in leadership. Um, do you have any guiding principles on leadership? Um, I'll stick to the advice that I was given a long time ago before I was teaching that I, I still hold on to. And that's, it's not about you. Mm -hmm. Like, um, you know, we, we live in a world that's very social and, and you, you have to communicate with various people, um, and their needs depending on that day. Like it always shifts. It's ever, it's ever evolving. And, um, I think like for me, I have to continue to remind myself like whatever is happening, whatever is reflected, like whether like I I'm not at fault. Um, And I say that only because sometimes we need a lot of reassurance about our work and um, people don't often do that because they're not thinking about you. They're thinking about themselves. And I'm not thinking, you know, like in my needing reassurance, I'm thinking about myself as well. Mm -hmm. So I have to remind myself like, whatever people are feeling or doing or, or public speakers who are, who are yelling at us and blaming us, like it's not about us. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you, you know, just like being open to listening is key. Um, you know, we just want to be heard. So I'm, I'm a great listener. People have told me, <laughs> shared a lot. Mm-hmm. So um, I think, you know, for me, that's, that's what it is. Okay. Okay. And now legacy. So, uh, you know, the, so since you've listened, you've heard that um, I named my company the Luther Harris Holding Company and his legacy is important to me. Mm-hmm. This is his dictionary. Okay, I finally get to see it. <laughs> <laughs> and these are my great grandmother's chairs. Oh. Um, and so one of his, you know, what he came here and did as a black man with a sixth grade education in this town. It's something that helps reassure me. His legacy helps, I think, send me out into the world to know that I can mm-hmm. do more. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you think about your legacy or legacy in general? Um, this this question has actually been coming up a lot because of Kobe mm. also. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and when I've thought, like, now thinking about it more and more, um, it really is... And I'm sure you, you've probably heard this too. It, it's really like how my children will be. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, I think about objects a lot because I don't, I, I practice detachment. Mm-hmm. I practice non-attachment. And, um, and that to me helps me like, like not, not have to hold dear things that are in, in the world and to just to kind of like remind myself to keep them alive in my, in my mind or in my heart. Um, and, and when I think about my own legacy, like the only real living thing of that will be my children Mm. and, and who they become. Um, and so I'm actually really excited about becoming a parent. I, I think I talk about it and I joke about it a lot. Um, but that, that is like a form of, of sharing like with the world who, 
who I am and how that's like evolved in other people. Yeah, I think you'd be a great parent. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) And thank you for coming on Cook on Monday morning. Yeah. This was fun. It was fun. Boom. (laughs) (laughs) Peace, peace. And thank you for listening to another episode of Cook on Monday morning. We had the lovely and the inspiring Gabriela Lopez on today's episode and you know everything that she has been doing at such a young age I think really represents the power of us citizens participating in their local government relying on you know the experience that they've had to inform their work and getting it done anyway even if it's not done the conventional way so thank you to her for coming on and sharing her story and for the work that she does on behalf of the families of San Francisco I'd also like to thank the people that make our podcast possible. I'd like to thank our videographer and producer, David Topete. Right on, homie. I appreciate you. I'd also like to thank Fernando Sico Marquez for uh, editing the newsletter. I'd also like to thank everyone that has been subscribing and telling their friends about Cook on Monday Morning. At Cook on Monday Morning, we believe that if you can change your Monday morning, you can change your week. If you change your week, you can change your year. And if you change your year you can change your life we have been on this journey together to build our community to 2020 subscribers by the april 30th 2020 i see the subscription notifications every day and i appreciate you greatly for spreading the word for talking about what we're doing here for giving me feedback Uh, please continue that if you want to reach out to me on twitter you can find me at stevon cook i also started a company called the luther harris holding company which provides strategic advising, brand awareness, and community engagement support that companies that are looking to grow in that direction. If, you, if you'd like to talk more about that, you can reach out to me via email, info at Stevon Cook. I just want to end this also by just thanking the people that make San Francisco the incredible place it is. They are our muni drivers, our teachers, our school lunch workers, people that work in our janitorial services. Uh, they're our first responders. They help keep our streets clean and they keep our city running. The city is what it is because of you. I greatly appreciate you. I look forward to continuing to build with you as we all improve our city and take it in a a better direction. I'd also like to acknowledge and appreciate and big up everybody that is in cities across the country helping to improve themselves and then go out and improve their cities by changing their Monday mornings. They are in places like LA, Houston, Dallas, New Orleans, Jackson, Mississippi, Philadelphia, Detroit, Miami, all over. Uh, Thank you. This podcast is for you. Please reach out to me. Let me know how it's going. I look forward to transforming 2020 together. Peace, peace, and we out.